just that they can't see you. See it all right? I can see you now, but I've lost you a couple times. Okay. Okay. So, Ellen's, oh, of course, a 
on the funny side of things, but her really her point is that we are continuously making decisions uh, throughout an entire day. We're making decisions. So um, if you think it's uh, something that you don't have to worry about, yeah, you do in your personal life. But as managers, you're going to find yourself making decisions that influence the company, that influence your own personal career, that influence other people's lives, um, your customers, and so on. So um, it's extremely important to uh, focus in on doing decision-making in an appropriate way. So um, let's start up with our PowerPoints here and let's see if I can get lucky I am to get this. Let's see here. Probably not so lucky. All right. I've got a PowerPoint here. How about other people? No. Now. Yes. yes. Okay. So we're going to take a look at what um, a decision is, and then we'll look at a process that we can follow to make decisions rationally. Uh, we'll talk about the role that intuition plays, and intuition is a very powerful factor in making decisions. You need to learn to listen to your inner self to. Uh, help make decisions. We'll also uh, look at other tools that are out there that can help us make decisions and then talk about uh, group decisions a little bit. So a decision is just a uh, choice between two or more available alternatives. This morning you had a choice between getting out of the bed or staying in the bed. Both very available alternatives to you and you had to choose. So that's making a decision. So what you want to do is to choose the best alternative to reach your overall objectives. Now I'm assuming that most of you that are in the class have an objective to get um, a maybe a degree or a transfer to a four-year school or a job somewhere, but one of the paths towards your objective is to actually uh, achieve some coursework, some education in the business field. So you're trying to reach that objective. What was your best alternative this morning? Was it to get up and come to class or to stay in bed? So hopefully you um, chose the best alternative for you. We have two basic types of decisions that are made. We have programmed decisions and non-programmed decisions. Okay. A programmed decision is routine and repetitive, okay? very structured, and there are some guidelines that are out there. Um, I was trying to think of a, some examples for program decisions. Uh, we have um, here a set of guidelines when a new student comes to us and wants to register for classes. We have a set of guidelines that we actually follow, um, particularly if they are trying to decide what they want to major in. Uh, those are structured and planned. They're repetitive. They're things that people here do on the job day in and day out. As managers, you may end up making more non-program decisions, which are unique, one-time type things, uh, much more uh, 
unstructured types of decisions. So uh, this chart does give you some examples of both the program and the non-program uh, <clears throat> decisions, um, both in a traditional environment and more up-to-date modern environments. Uh, traditionally, the program decisions are done out of habit or clerical routine uh, or based on the organization's structure. Uh, modern, we have tools available like computer simulations and uh, mathematical models and electronic data processing that can help us make decisions. On the non-program side, though, that's where uh, we've always just used our judgment and our intuition. Sometimes we had rules of thumbs that we followed. Uh, sometimes we actually uh, chose executives and trained them on traditional decision-making techniques. But now we have computerized applications that can actually uh, train human decision-makers um, available for us as well. So um, lots of new tools out there to help us. And as I kind of alluded to, as you get more and more um, involved in management, you go from lower level to middle to upper level management, you are going to be making more and more broad type decisions. Um, and your responsibility will increase for those decisions. So um, low level management has more of a narrow decision scope. They are not empowered to make as many decisions as our upper level management are. So decision makers are just the individuals or the groups that make the choice among the alternatives. Um, Everyone has some type of orientation towards making a decision. Uh, you'll find folks in your um, company that are, some of them, receptive to just about all kinds of alternatives. You'll find others who exploit certain alternatives or hoard them. Ever known anybody who wanted to make all the decisions themselves, didn't want to delegate anything, that's a hoarder. And then you find those who are completely marketing oriented, which are they're doing things in order to um, sell and increase the profits of your company. Always remember when you are making a decision in a business environment that uh, you should take a look at your organization's objectives. What is it your organization is trying to obtain? And then look at all the existing alternatives that are relevant. Possible. I mean, it doesn't do you any good to look at uh, alternatives that you can't uh, possibly achieve. Okay. Um, you want to rank your alternatives from most desirable to least desirable, and then make your choice among all of your alternatives. Now, I think of um, some of the decision making that's going on right now. I hope you all are planning on watching the State of the Union address tonight. Uh, we're going to probably find out what our president's decision has been regarding government shutdown in the future again, uh, regarding uh, border security. So there is certainly a lot that has gone into his decision-making process. It uh, has not been an individual decision. It's been uh, more uh, input from many, many other people. So we'll look at his uh, rationale for making whatever choice he makes if he exposes that to us tonight. Uh, we also have somebody else in politics right now in the state of Virginia who is facing pretty big decision. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We're talking about our governor, okay, who um, is faced with a decision of whether to resign or not, okay? And um, he has lots of influence from a lot of different people, organizations, and so on. So far, 
least I haven't watched the news this afternoon, but so far his decision has been to not resign, but there may be influences to convince him otherwise. I don't think we've seen the end of this one play out yet, so um, certainly somewhere along the line he made a decision to have that picture show up next to his name on the, in the yearbook, and now uh, he may be finding out that his decision was not a good one, and he's having to make another decision. So um, doesn't mean we're always going to be right when we follow our decisions, but definitely interesting. So we are presented with a rational decision-making process. You're going to see this in just about every business class, there's some variation of this little process that um, is proposed for you to use whenever you have to make a decision. Um, first of all, you want to figure out what your problem is. Okay, what is it you're trying to solve? And then come up with various different solutions. Okay, select the most beneficial alternative implement it and then the step that a lot of managers leave out is the last one which is to gather feedback and revise if necessary um, and go back and it kind of becomes a circle after that point so you see some managers make decisions um, implement them some of them don't even implement them after they make the decision but uh, implement them but they forget to get feedback to see how well their decision making process work. And if you don't do that, you are not gathering information so that you can make better decisions in the future. So the next few slides kind of talk about each one of those steps. Um, the first of course is to identify the problem. It's only after you know that there's a problem out there that you can take the steps to eliminate it. Okay, uh, Barnard came up with some uh, sources to identify your problems. Uh, you can look at what your supervisors ordered you to do. You can look at situations that your employees have had. Um, you can look at uh, the normal activity of managers themselves to see uh, what kind of problems are out there. Um, simple one. Um, got up this morning and I couldn't get to work, I'm making this up, because I have a flat top. Okay? Identifying the problem. It took me a, it would take me a few minutes to go out there and take a look at my car and see, oh, I'm not going anywhere because my tire's flat. Or maybe even I got in the car, started driving, and realized it was flat. Um, so I had to get various pieces of input before I could identify why I couldn't get to work this morning. All right, then come up with alternative solutions. All right, well, let's think about my flat tire. What kind of solutions could I have for my flat tire? What do you think I could do? And you can just brainstorm. You don't have to, I mean, there's no one best answer here at this point. What could I do if I walked out and found out I had a flat tire? Change it. I could change it myself, okay? What else could I do? Hmm? Put air in it myself and just hope that it stays pumped up until I got to work. Yeah, that happens some. I, my daughter drove on her leaking tire for about a month before she finally took it to the dealer and got them to, and it took them twice to locate a teeny tiny nail that was causing the problem. Okay, but she just kept going by the gas station and putting in some air. All right, what else could I do? Call somebody else and catch a ride. Good alternative, yeah. If I happen to have a second car, what can I do? I drive the other car, okay? How about if I just took a look at the flat tire and walked back in the house and crawled back in the bed? That's an alternative, right? I mean, I'm sure you have had days like that where just said, oh, screw it, I'm going home. Okay, 
lots of different <laughs> alternatives out there. Um, there are things that will uh, limit some of your alternatives, moral and ethical norms. Maybe hitchhiking could work would be an idea. Yeah, I'm not so sure that's a good one, okay? So there might be some legal, I don't know about it. My daughter asked me the other day, did you ever hitchhike when you were in high school and college? That was really popular when I was growing up. You know, people that went to college would hitchhike home. Um, I don't know, is it legally, it's okay to hitchhike? So, no, oh, it's not, it's, it's illegal now. That's what I was thinking, back then it wasn't illegal. It was, might have been stupid, but um, and even more stupid now, yeah, you, there's lots of people that I would not think would be a good idea to get in the car with. Um, so there, there are legal restrictions on that alternative. Social norm, okay, um, oral policies and rules, moral and ethical norms. I guess I could have um, gotten a ride to the car tire dealer and stolen a tire. I mean, that's that's not uh, a moral or ethical choice that I could make. That's just off the list already. So um, you may come up with some alternatives that just get thrown out right away because they are uh, morally and ethically incorrect. Dr. Henderson. Yes. The PowerPoint is not moving. The what? The PowerPoint is not moving. It's not moving. Uh, they may not have the 
computational power either in their own brains or perhaps in whatever computerized systems they have or uh, other tools available. Maybe they just simply don't know enough to make a proper decision. Let's think about a manager who is trying to having to make a decision on hiring somebody. Okay. Um, they could probably spend days and weeks getting to know each individual person who has applied for the job, uh, doing background searches and that kind of stuff, but they are bounded in terms of time. So much so that managers will often what we call satisfice, which is a combination of sacrifice and satisfaction, meaning they're going to make a decision that is just good enough. Oh, I'm going to hire that person. That's good enough. We can move forward from there on. Okay. So we, we don't know everything when we make decisions, and we don't have all the time to find out everything. Now, intuition does play a big role, and some people overlook that. That Intuition is your inborn ability to synthesize information quickly and effective. Um, I've actually read books on learning how to develop your intuition because sometimes we don't listen to ourselves when we should, uh, particularly in situations where it comes to uh, fear. Okay, um, I don't know if any of you all I'm, I'm addicted to ID channel, investigation, discovery channel that um, shows all these crime type scenes and things, situations where people get killed and all. If you think about it, a whole lot of those show that the people had some kind of intuition that things weren't right before that things went too much further. They just did not carefully listen to their own intuition. Um, You've heard of people that uh, had intuition that they should fly a plane today if something was going to happen. Um, sometimes you need to listen to that intuition, and other times you need to make sure that you're not just uh, creating false information for yourself. Heuristics are simple rules of thumbs to help you make decisions. Okay? And biases are decisions that are made based on those rules of thumbs, and they introduce flaws um, into your decisions sometimes. So if you're biased in one direction or another, you may not make the correct decision. <laughs> Here are some different types of biases. Uh, you may find yourself uh, subject to some of those, a bandwagon effect is the tendency to believe that certain outcomes will occur just because other people believe they will. Okay, and they give you that example there. Um, the stock market will increase. Do you believe that just because other people have said it or because you've actually done some research yourself? Confirmation bias is the tendency to search for information that supports your preconceived beliefs. Not looking at everything, but you're looking for just the stuff that supports whatever you have already uh, come to believe, but you're ignoring information that contradicts it. Loss aversion is uh, people who tend to actually uh, prefer to avoid loss rather than acquire gains. So their decisions were always, well, let's be safe. Let's not uh, lose anything here. Overconfidence is your own ability to accept, uh, assess your prediction of future events. Are your forecasts as good as you really think they are? And then unrealistic optimism is the tendency to believe that you are less susceptible to uh, risky events than other people are. I don't know what all that garbage is down here at the end of this little thing here. It's just like something got over on the, um, the PowerPoint that didn't go up there. There. So 
So some of the mathematical tools that are out there that can help us make decisions, one is probability theory. That is where you call, uh, calculate the expected value of an alternative. Uh, this particular one looks at the income the alternative will produce multiplied by the probability of that income. So let's say you're making a decision on um, introducing a new product in your company. Um, you can make use of probability theory by coming up with the expected value, which would give you uh, incomes that you think you would generate multiplied times the probability of those incomes occurring. You can also use decision trees, which are graphic tools uh, that display different steps that take place in the decision process. This one is uh, not too very complicated, but it's a, a, a choice a company is making to, choice A is to build a big plant, or B to build a small plant, okay? Uh, and they are looking at um, the demand that's involved. They've actually sketched it out, so you'll know that uh, if they have high average demand or low average demand, what direction they should go. If they have initially high demand or initially low demand, what direction they should go. And if we follow through the steps there, it will kind of lead them to um, what decisions should be made. Some people tend to say, I don't want to make decisions by myself. Let's have a group decision. Okay. Group decisions can be very advantageous, but we're also going to look at some of the downsides of it. Um, obviously, if you have a group of people make a decision, you've got more alternatives out there. People can just come up with more things that you could possibly do, just like we came up with different ideas with the flat tire there. We're also able to draw on people's collective experiences. I may never have had a flat tire before in my life, but somebody in here might have, and they can um, explain what they did in that situation. Also, a big benefit is if a person has involvement in making, the, making a decision, they tend to buy into it. Okay? That's used a lot to try to get your staff people to do certain things. If you involve them in the decision making, then they'll buy into it a lot easier. Uh, group members tend to identify decisions as their own and they have a feeling of ownership when a decision is made. Now on the downside, whenever you get a group of people together, it's gonna to take you longer to make a decision. Okay, certainly um, input from more than one person, it means there are other alternatives you're going to consider, you're going to batter back and forth, what the pros and cons are, and so on. You're also going to have higher costs, because all of these people are going to be taking their time, their additional time to uh, be involved in a group. If the decisions happen to be made in the group because of friendships or relationships, among the group members, sometimes you get lower quality decisions, okay? Uh, you have a group of people um, trying to decide who you should be hired and um, the people on the committee, one person speaks up and everybody else says, oh, I like her, so let's, let's go with her decision. Group think is the negative impact of group decision making. Okay, that's the term for the negative impact. Always think of group impact. I don't know if any of you ever watched the show Family Feud, okay, where they've got two families and they have to answer, fill in the last words on the little uh, thing, and see if who can get the highest uh, on the scale of answers there. Have you ever thought that somebody in that, one of the groups just made a really stupid, stupid answer? What will the rest of them do? They don't look at them like crazy. They go, good answer, good answer, don't they? That's group thing, okay? Um, that's uh, group decision making is backfiring there just because they're trying to support each other. I 
I'm sure they're prompted to do that on the show too, but um, that certainly is group think where um, the decision making doesn't come up with necessarily the right answer. Brainstorming, we did a little bit of that earlier when we were talking about our flat tire. Um, this is when people are allowed to come up with ideas. Um, somebody records those ideas uh, and the idea is evaluated only after they have been recorded. Nobody says, oh, that's a stupid idea or that's a really good idea along the way. Wait until you record them. The comments are not made until everybody has had input. Very helpful sometimes. People don't feel as inhibited to come up with um, information if they know that their comments are not going to be evaluated right off the bat. Um, nominal group techniques is where everybody writes down their own ideas and then the present those orally and the entire group will discuss them. Uh, a secret ballot vote is taken and the idea with the most votes is the one that gets implemented. Um, I'm not real fond of that one because I don't really think that um, a lot of time is spent on that discussion, even though that's one of the uh, steps there where the entire group discusses ideas simultaneously. Um, perhaps the secret ballot does take away some of the group thing things going on and the friendship side of things, but uh, not actually beneficial for most things that I've, I've ever dealt with. The Delphi technique has um, a problem put before them and then those group members will come up with solutions through anonymous questionnaires. Okay, so what do you think? Okay. Uh, the responses are compiled and then sent out to all the group members uh, and certain members in the group will choose the solution and the solution is reached. Santa has it all the time to stay in Okay, so brainstorming is good because you get lots and lots of ideas. Nominal group technique, you don't have to fear, you don't have any fear about anybody retaliating about your contributions. Um, Delphi technique, you can collect questionnaire data from people all over the place. You don't all have to be sitting down in a room together to be able to get your information. Uh, right now, we're using a Delphi technique um, to help come up with you see it on the front of our uh, web page, you know, on the Blackboard page, there's some information about please submit your um, characteristics you would like to see for our new president of our college. All right, that's a questionnaire type thing where it's reached out to a lot of different people. We are not all having to come to the same location to get that input. Um, and you really don't have to be afraid of what you're saying. Brainstorming, however, can be very time consuming. The nominal group technique, you can't always figure out why people voted the way they did. And the Delphi technique, you're not able to ask questions. Okay? Why did you think leadership was an important quality for a president? All right, so. Let's take a look at our, get this off here. Uh, I've got one more video for you, for you, and I hope you will enjoy. Hopefully this one works well.
Pepsi has always given Coke a tough time. To compete with Pepsi, Coke, back in the 80s, decided to come up with a new Coke and with a new taste. They developed the product and went for a huge market study and conducted more than 200,000 taste tests to see how it fared. The results were overwhelming. Not only did it taste it better than the original, but people preferred it over Pepsi as well. However, if Coke was to stay ahead of Pepsi, it couldn't have two different directly competing products on the shelves at the same time. It therefore decided to scrap the original Coca-Cola and introduce the new Coke in its place. Initially, the sales of the new Coke went sky high. Since the company could not keep two competing brands on the shelf, they decided to stop the production of original Coke. As soon as the decision was announced, a large percentage of U.S. population immediately decided to buy out the new product and the sales of new Coke took a nose dive. What happened was that despite spending millions of dollars on the consumer research, the research could not measure or reveal the psychological and emotional attachment of the U.S. population to Coke. Ultimately, the company had to reintroduce the old Coke, the classic Coke. In case of Xerox, when Xerox invented photocopying machine, they went into the market asking people if they need photocopying machine or not. And it turned out that no one wanted a photocopying machine since everyone was using carbon papers in the typewriters. Even companies like IBM and General Electric rejected the idea of photocopying machine. But this did not stop Xerox to market their machine. The CEO had good intuition. They marketed it and it became so successful in North America that photocopying came to be properly known as Xeroxing. It is still written as XRC, Xerox copy. The idea is, if you remember in the last lecture, we said that we need to have both rational decision making skills and some intuitive ability also. Sometimes it's your intuition which is very important. As uh, they say in the management, that it is your gut feeling that is also very important. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more, click the link below in the description box. Okay, so um, I know you all are babies, but I clearly remember the Coke little fiasco. I can remember the pulling Coke off the shelves and replacing it with new Coke. It's actually called new Coke. I can also remember nobody wanting to buy the new Coke. And uh, they had to actually pull that and reinvent Coke and they to the old way and they named it Coke class. I remember it so very well. And that is known in business as one of the biggest marketing mess ups in history. On the other hand, look at Xerox. Xerox, um, can you imagine? Folks said that they didn't want it at all. And nowadays, if we could, wow, I would love to have my own Xerox machine in my own house. I would love to have um, the ability to uh, copy just about anything I wanted, whatever I wanted it. Um, and typewriters and carbon paper have gone by the wayside. The study showed that nobody wanted it, yet the producers decided intuitively, they just knew that this was going to be okay. This is going to be a money maker. And clearly it has been. So, Use the rational decision-making process that we have talked about, but don't forget to let your intuition also play a part in what you're doing. Okay, listen to your inner guts. Okay, you've got a Coke back there. Does it say Coke Classic now, or does it just say Coke? I think they've taken the um, word classic off now. But for a while, you could find both in the stores. 
and they had to put the word classic on the original uh, so that people could know what decision to make. So, um, it was an interesting time, very interesting time, big, big mess. All right, you all have um, a homework assignment showing up on Blackboard for this week. It's to develop your own personal mission statement. Okay, and um, there's a link on there where you can read some mission statements for um, chief executive officers. You may not be a CEO, now, but um, it kind of gives you an idea of what you're going for there. Um, I have graded the first homework that came in, and I do suggest you go back and take a look at that, um, see my comments. Um, I, I tried to focus in on the content of what you were saying, although I cannot help but um, mark up grammatical problems, especially when it comes to sentence structure, but I can't even understand a sentence. And if you all are in business, you need to learn to write professionally. So go back in and see any kind of comments that I have made there. I will hopefully get on to the second assignment pretty quickly here. And it's, I have a lot. I have um, five classes, five of these classes combined. Not all of them. Um, I have 20-some, 23 or 24 students online in this class as well. So it takes me a while to read through everything and read comments. So go back and not only where you see your grade, but you can go into the document that you submitted and I have put little comments regarding things. So try your best to use your uh, correct grammar and sentence structure, structure in your uh, assignments as well. Because again, I'm, I'm visualizing these as the professional type documents. Um, and uh, I think the one that you have uh, on the board for this week is due Sunday, so um, it shouldn't take you too long just to gather your thoughts together and think about what you want your mission statement to be. And I usually find you all have some very, very aspiring missions that you'd like to accomplish. So um, all kinds of things like contributing to the community or to the family or to or uh, companies and, and or creating new products or becoming millionaires or all kinds of things. So um, let your mind roam, do your own little brainstorming and see if you can come up with something good there. <clears throat> and I will see you Thursday from South Boston. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.